Hello class, welcome to lecture 22, and in this lecture we're going to talk about some the different classifications of thunderstorms in the atmosphere. Uh, I'm also going to cover photographs, and towards the end of the lecture we're going to cover some information related to composite parameters, which takes the information we obtain from photographs and also the information we obtain from uh, buoyancy, the instability parameters in the atmosphere, and sort of combines those to sort of assess uh, the potential hazards that might be in place. But we'll get into that as we go through the course of the lecture. But the first topic that we're going to address is the different classifications of thunderstorms in the atmosphere. So uh, the first one that we're going to look at is what's referred to as a single cell thunderstorm, and another term for this is an ordinary thunderstorm. And these typically occur in a barotropic environment, and that is, again, an environment that has very weak to no vertical wind shear present uh, in the atmosphere. So as a consequence, when the thunderstorm goes up, so again, the red arrow here representing the updraft, and that forms the cloud and the precipitation, and then as that, because of the weak vertical wind shear, the precipitation forms directly over the updraft. And since that, cl that, um, that air is full of cold, uh, cold liquid water, cold air and liquid water, uh, it's much more dense than the updraft. So that just falls onto the updraft and then it just completely chokes off the updraft. And just to sort of illustrate that process, so the red arrow goes up, forms a thunderstorm, precipitation forms, the precipitation falls directly onto the updraft, and in the process of doing so, uh, the fuel supply for the thunderstorm is cut off, and with a warm, moist inflow cut off from the thunderstorm, the thunderstorm then goes into a dissipation stage. So as a result, these thunderstorms tend to be very short-lived, since the uh, downdraft eventually, the, that is the current of cold, moist air that descends downward, uh, the downdraft basically cuts the updraft off as soon as the precipitation begins. So as a result, these thunderstorms tend to be very short-lived. And the next type of thunderstorm that we can deal with in the atmosphere is what's referred to as a multicell, which you can sort of think of as a sequence of individual single-cell thunderstorms. And these typically exist in uh, atmospheres that don't have strong vertical wind shear, that we don't have weak vertical wind shear. They have, if you will, moderate vertical wind shear present in the atmosphere. So the way that these work is the thunderstorm goes up, an individual thunderstorm goes up, and that then produces some precipitation. But because you have some degree of wind shear present, some of the precipitation is forced away from the updraft. And then as that resulting downdraft comes down to the ground, uh, one of the cells decays, but this current of cold air then triggers the next updraft. So this current of cold air, as it's moving outward towards unstable air, it's triggering more and more additional thunderstorms, it's triggering more and more additional updrafts, which become matured thunderstorms and then become decaying thunderstorms. So uh, you can sort of think of this as a, single, as a, a sequence of individual thunderstorms where you have a thunderstorm that's initially going up right at the leading edge of the at the what we call a cold pool, which is this current of cold air that moves laterally in the horizontal direction. So this current of cold air triggers the thunderstorm updraft, get a developing thunderstorm, and then that thunderstorm then evolves into a mature thunderstorm, which starts producing its own precipitation, and then at some point uh, the downdraft will stabilize the underside of the thunderstorm, and as this downdraft hits the ground, it spreads uh, horizontally, it spreads out horizontally, and triggers an additional thunderstorm updraft. But typically in the atmosphere, this is what the configuration you get from a multicell. And there's actually two different types of multicell thunderstorms, a forward propagating and a backward propagating multicell. A forward propagating multicell has the cold pool and the, uh, well, the propagation and the cell movement are moving in the same direction. So uh, in this case, the cold pool is moving uh, from left to right on the screen and the thunderstorm itself, the individual thunderstorms are moving from the left to the right on the screen. So they're moving in the same direction. And that's the key for a forward propagating multicell. And that is the individual thunderstorms and the cold pool are both moving in the same direction. And this is tip a pretty typical uh, this is pretty typically what we observe in the atmosphere with a multicell. We have a multicell thunderstorm that is uh, moving from west to east, and the cold pool is also moving from west to east. And this would be the kind of thunderstorm mode that you would get from, say, a squall line or a quasi-linear convective system, or QLCS, as it's often abbreviated. In a backward propagating multicell, the cold pool and the individual cell motions are moving in opposite directions. So this, uh, so here, this the uh, thunderstorm is still moving from left to right, but the cold pool is moving from right to left. And a lot of times, with the case of a backward propagating multicell, you can end up with a fairly substantial flash flooding threat because these typically don't move very fast. You have 
uh, just this cold pool that's continually triggering thunderstorm activity, and those thunderstorms are all moving over the same area. A forward propagating multicell can also produce heavy rain, although it's usually not as much of a concern for flooding. It is primarily going to be producing more straight line wind damage than anything else, but uh, Dapper propagating multicells can produce uh, very significant amounts of rain in a very uh, localized area. So these are going to be posing more of a flash flooding risk than anything else. That is, if your thunderstorm and your cold pool are moving in opposite directions. And the final main thunderstorm that we can work with is uh, the supercell thunderstorm, which has a very well-organized uh, structure where the th uh, thunderstorm updraft and downdraft are very well separated, and so supercell thunderstorms typically exist in environments that have strong vertical wind shear. That is, the precipitation core is carried very far away from the individual updraft. The updraft is very well filtered out, and the th updraft is able to uh, f uh, continuously fuel itself. It's able to get all the fuel that it needs, all the warm moist air that it needs to sustain itself. And if it were allowed to continue this uh, if it were completely unimpeded, if there was only one supercell and there was that was the only storm on the globe, that supercell would theoretically be allowed to uh, maintain itself indefinitely. So both multi-cells and supercells tend to be very long-lived, but uh, supercells are definitely the more intense. And the reason why is because you have the stronger vertical wind shear, which is keeping the precipitation much farther away from the updraft. And it also turns out that, like multi-cells, supercells can be broken down into additional subcategories. Uh, one of which is the low precipitation supercell, a schematic of which is what you're seeing on the screen right here. And they are called low precipitation supercells because they don't produce a whole lot in the way of precipitation. And these also tend to have very high cloud bases, narrow updraft towers, and typically exist in dry environments and also exist where the vertical wind shear is especially intense. It's really uh, forcing the precipitation away from the updraft. And usually the precipitation that you do get from a low precipitation supercell is just hail. You might get a little bit of rain, probably not a lot of rain though. Uh, the main uh, precipitation that you get from a low precipitation supercell is usually hail, and that can be quite sizable hail. And uh, these also are kind of tricky because these, uh, these don't show up on radar very well, and sometimes it's very difficult to detect low precipitation supercells on radar because they don't produce very much liquid water. Uh, so uh, these can these can uh, be kind of interesting beasts to work with. They're pretty deceptive. You don't really see much in the way of precipitation beneath the anvil, but in that anvil is going to be quite a bit of hail and possibly some very significant hail. And uh, these can also produce tornadoes, although usually their main, the main hazard of low precipitation supercells will be straight line winds and very large hail. And the classic supercell typically has a wider updraft tower and also has a cloud base that's closer to the ground so it doesn't form in the especially dry environments but it still has strong vertical wind shear and this is more typical of what you find say over the plains where you have uh, beneath the anvil you have a nice uh, healthy mixture of both large hail and heavy downpours. Uh, the, uh, the key thing with the classic supercell is the updraft area is still there's no precipitation there to really speak of. Sometimes you can get little bouts of precipitation in the updraft, but for the most part, most of the precipitation is concentrated away from the updraft and uh, beneath the anvil of the thunderstorm, way ahead of the updraft. And these are usually the one, these are usually the thunderstorms that are uh, best for uh, best suited for producing tornadoes, but they can also produce straight line winds and of course very large hail. And then the other form of supercell is the high precipitation supercell or heavy precipitation supercell, where they just have even broader updraft towers, even lower cloud bases, and these just dump copious amounts of rain and hail all over the storm, even in parts of the updraft. Uh, even in a, and uh, it's ahead of the ahead of the updraft, you can get some extremely intense rainfall rates and some uh, pretty intense hail falling. And this would be a uh, thunderstorm that you would typically find say in the southeast or along the Gulf Coast, if you've got sufficiently strong wind shear down there. Occasionally you'll see these on the plains and uh, also uh, farther north, but usually these are a particularly common uh, storm to see in the southeast. And uh, these can be especially nasty because these can also produce tornadoes, but because there's so much precipitation falling all throughout the storm, if there is a tornado, it's probably going to be hidden or obscured by all the precipitation that's falling. And uh, those, are, uh, those are pretty scary tornadoes to deal with. Tornadoes by themselves are scary, but imagine a tornado that you can't even see. That's, that, that's even scarier than, it, than just a regular tornado. But a lot of times in these environments, the heavy, high precipitation supercell will have an environment that has more moisture and also 
weaker vertical wind shear. It will the vertical wind shear will still be strong, but it won't be as intense as say a, an environment that is supporting a classic supercell. Now, these can also produce extremely heavy rain rates. You can get uh, sometimes quick one to two inches of rain uh, in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, these can produce some really insane rainfall rates.